let me introduce um, Simon Badger. So, thank you very much. Um, yeah, um, I didn't quite know what you guys wanted to know, so I hope you'll butt in and ask questions whenever you have them. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my career um, as, you know, past the PhD through postdocs, various postdocs, and uh, finally where I am now, which is in Durham, not in Edinburgh, as it's listed on the uh, information, because between the time we wrote that and the time thing I moved, which fits into the, the expectations of what the life of a postdoc is like. So I'm now um, at Durham, at the Institute of Particle Physics Phenomenology, uh, and I have a fellowship, five-year fellowship from the STFC. Okay, so I hope you can all read this, by the way. I know the screen's a little bit small, but um, I'll, uh, if, you, if you really struggle, then uh, I don't know, there's a couple of seats further at the front that you can squeeze up. Um, but yeah, I just want, thought I'd ask myself a few questions um, about what kind of things maybe I wanted to know when I was thinking about this stuff. Uh, when I was doing my PhD, um, and maybe it also inspires you to think of questions you'd like to add, and we can uh, talk about it at the end. But yeah, how did I get into to physics, right? How did I end up doing theoretical particle physics? Um, uh, you know, what does it mean to have a career path in academia, right? It's pretty vague, it's pretty open-ended, uh, and it is often quite difficult to get good information on what it means, right? Because if you talk to the people who have got all the way to having a permanent position, they probably didn't look much off that path. Um, so we'll have a look to see what that means. Um, yeah, what do I really enjoy about my job? Okay, I guess that's uh, the thing that has answered the, uh, the other question, what's kept me from leaving academia, right? Because I do quite enjoy what I'm doing. And uh, yeah, if I went back again, you know, would I do anything differently? Would I change the way I approached it to uh, help me get through it? Um, okay, good. So just to go back over a quick resume of what I've been doing. So I started off in Durham, where I'm back now. Uh, that was in 1999, all those years ago, that I moved to do a maths and physics degree uh, for four years, master's. And um, I was already sort of getting interested in doing research, even at that stage. I, was, uh, I did a couple of summer projects, um, one in Durham and then one in Daisy Hamburg, where I went to do my first sort of introduction to particle physics. Uh, and that experience uh, was positive enough to make me think that I wanted to do uh, a PhD. So uh, I moved into particle theory at the IPPP, um, where I spent three years until 2006. I then left Durham to do lots and lots of things for nearly 10 years uh, before I came back uh, to the UK on the Rutherford Fellowship, and that's going to convert into a lectureship in Durham uh, when that, uh, that grant uh, finishes. So it's sort of been a circle for me of where I've gone. Right. So my PhD studies, just as a, I mean, a quick, I don't want to go too much into details of physics, but I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. Um, so um, my thesis title was On Shell Methods for uh, perturbative QCD. Um, QCD is theories of strong interactions and we're looking at this at very high energies, the energies that we can measure in colliders and on-shell methods is basically new ways to calculate the probability of seeing various events. So m methods that are more efficient, methods that allow us to study more and more complex observables. Right? So when talking about doing things with precision then we need to come up with new techniques because often we look into the theory and it's just lots and lots of stuff. So it becomes you know, prohibitively expensive to look in certain regions of the phase space. We've got lots of data and we'd like to look at it in the maximum possible way. Right? So that's what sort of like gives me the cross between something where we're really thinking about data and we're really looking at physics and something which is much more like doing mathematics. Right? And I sort of switch between those two things as and when it feels like a good idea. Okay, so yeah, that's where I started, and I've sort of ke kept in a very similar area since then. Um, so this is my only slide on physics, but uh, I do think it you know, sets the scene for why I do what I do, so I thought I'd tell you. Um, so I develop um, 
sort of efficient tools and methods. So methods meaning just looking at mathematics, but I also have to turn that into a tool that we can really do physics with. So that means I have to do lots of programming, that kind of stuff. Programming varying from you know, algebraic manipulation to C++ and numerics and things like that, because if we want to compare with the data, we have to do fairly intensive computations. Um, once we've set all that technology up, we can look into you know, the events that we see at the LHC and try and understand um, what we're finding in the data. So really looking at precision QCD. And now it's kind of a fun time to do that because you really need a lot of data to study some of these rarer events. Uh, and that's the kind of thing that we can, uh, we can push with our technology um, and you know, hopefully find out some new things um, about uh, the theory that we see there. There's another part to it, which is much more formal, um, but equally interesting to me, um, which is just uh, trying to understand the basic structures in quantum field theory. So by asking ourselves, why is this quantity simpler after I've finished the calculation and therefore I can make it efficient and produce something with it? Um, why does it look like that? And if I understand that, then I can come up with a shortcut to get to that answer, which enables us then to you know, feed through to the next stage. Right. So yeah, it's both of those things and I think they're fairly wide-reaching questions. So obviously it takes a long time to sit down and, and do these calculations. You have to uh, commit to those things, you know they're going to take a, a good deal of time. Um, but in the end of the day, you know, the data is there to guide you and hopefully you can find something in it. All right, that's my physics pitch. So let's move on to a little bit more practical uh, things about how I went about uh, doing that. Uh, and the first thing I noticed is I did, I went to quite a few places. Um, I stayed in Europe, so after my <coughs> PhD, sorry, I'm using the pointer. Um, so after my PhD in Durham, uh, I moved to Paris. So I worked at the COR, which is the nuclear research lab just south of Paris. Um, and I spent two years there uh, as, uh, as a postdoc. Um, yeah, Saclay is quite a long distance from Paris but I lived in Paris because it was fun and uh, commuted the hour each way to get into the office. Uh, but as a theorist, we can sort of work on the move. So I spent a bit of time working in Paris, working from home, working in some of the labs in Paris and just chatting to people around there. There was a sort of community of people that you could chat with and that was uh, quite productive. Um, but it was also a big jump at that point. That was um, something I can definitely say like from doing a PhD where everything was fairly well guided and structured to essentially, I mean, this is obviously quite different, I think, for experimental physicists, but for me, moving from PhD to postdoc, they basically gave me a key to an office and said, enjoy, do some work. Um, and definitely took me a bit of a learning curve to get used to that. Um, and just really being an independent researcher, uh, and learning to be what, what that meant. Um, yeah, so it was the, the first year was definitely hard work. Um, a lot of people say you never work harder than you did for your PhD. That's not true for me. After I did my PhD, I really had to put some hours in. But okay, but I was learning stuff, so I was happy. Um, very good. So then uh, after Paris, uh, I moved on to another capital city. I went to work in Berlin. So uh, DAISY, uh, Deutsche Elektron Synchrotron, had a site over there. Uh, and I spent two years there doing similar kind of things. Um, getting a little bit more involved with um, students and things, but both of those places are research labs, so I didn't have any access to undergraduate teaching or anything like that, it was just pure research, do your things. Um, and yeah, I was working pretty independently at this point, right? so um, coming up with my own papers and things like that. Uh, and that's when I moved to Copenhagen at the end of that period, so uh, I spent three years uh, there. I actually got a grant from the Danish um, Research Council um, to, to work there, and it was actually a five-year position um, that I moved to, um, but uh, I decided that CERN was more interesting at that time, so uh, I took a move in 2013 to, to go to Geneva, um, and it was while I was in Geneva that I got the STFC fellowship, which gave me the chance to come back to the UK, um, which was always sort of the, the end game for me, that I wanted to come back to the UK and uh, the SDFC fellowship was a really good opportunity for me to do that. Um, so, yeah, so that kind of worked out quite nicely and then 
once I got to Edinburgh, it was a question of trying to negotiate whether I could stay for longer, uh, and Durham came up with an offer which allowed me to stay for longer. So I transferred all the money to, to Durham just, uh, just last month, and that's where I'm going to stay, at least for the foreseeable future. But who knows? I haven't stayed in one place for very long. And okay, that's I think is a, a picture that you would uh, expect to see. Um, the positions, some of them only two years, doesn't give you a long time to get used to things. But I actually found it quite useful that, that there was a, a tight deadline because you know, it really encourages you to, to finish things. So that's one of the things that John said this morning at the end of his talks, it's really important to finish things. And that's something that I definitely have a problem with on the whole. I like to sit and think about stuff. Um, if I was left to my own devices, I would do that. Uh, and obviously a big part of the job is to make sure you communicate and get your ideas out there. And uh, having these kind of deadlines definitely uh, helped me through that um, during this. And you just learn quicker. You go to different places, talk to different people. You know, you're learning more stuff. Um, so, yeah, it's difficult from, you know, the, the nature that you actually just have to pack <coughs> your stuff into boxes. I'm pretty good at it by now. I can pack all my stuff into boxes and move to the next place quite, quite, uh, quite well and efficiently. But, um, yeah, I think there are positive sides to that as well. And, of course, the places I've lived, I've really enjoyed them. Right? It's been quite exciting living in all these different uh, areas in Europe. All right. So... Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, what, what I actually do as day-to-day -day, uh, jobs, um, but I think we kind of know these things. Um, but I want to highlight a couple of things um, there which I think have helped me sort of develop. I think it's quite important when you're doing lots of different positions that each one is a step up, each one is, is going somewhere, and you're not just moving from one postdoc doing the same thing to another one. Right? So there are opportunities to get involved in other parts of teaching, uh, getting involved with PhD students, getting involved with organising various different events uh, that happen in the institution. It's a good way to get involved in the institute, but it's also a good way to learn new, new um, skills. All right, so kind of skills, um, I think that uh, we develop by doing this kind of stuff, are pretty generic. Um, I hope you can read my little uh, stupid things, but it doesn't matter if you can't. I just uh, pluck them off the internet. Um, but uh, I think, okay, so what kind of skills do we develop? I think one of the things that as um, uh, physicists, astrophysicists, that we definitely use a lot is computers. So that's the, the key sort of technique that people would, would go to. I wouldn't say particularly for me that it was the, you know, particular languages or something that you've learned. But it's the fact that if you need to, you can pick up a new tool because you know how to learn those kind of things. You know how to think in that way. Uh, and that's definitely a strong thing that, I mean, applies way outside of um, the realms of academic work that I do. Um, the, uh, the top left there uh, is a little one about presentations. Yes, we have to learn to do presentations. As theoretical physicists, we're probably not the best uh, reputation for public speaking, but uh, that's some, definitely something I've had to learn um, during the course of my, uh, my uh, postdoc career. I still don't think I'm particularly good at it, but you, know, you always learn new things. Um, the other part, which I think is, again, very important for changing from the PhD, I said there was this large jump up. So at the bottom left, I just put a little, uh, paint palette because it's very creative. You have to think of the problems. We talked a lot about problem solving, but which problems are you going to look to? Which one is the most interesting? Which ones? And that, that's something I think that uh, is one of the more interesting, but it's probably more vague and difficult to come up with. But yeah, I think what we do is very creative. And science doesn't often get looked in that way, but I think it's quite an important part. Um, and the other one is just being stubborn and persistent and being prepared to stick through bad times, of which there are lots, because you just keep trying things and nothing works. And uh, you have to know somehow that the bigger picture is worth it and you're going to find a way through there somehow. So a bit of confidence that you've chosen the right way, uh, not like this cartoon. Um, anyway. So uh, the other job, of course, is publishing things, right? If you're going to move on to the next position, you have to publish um, work. Um, I think there's a lot of transferable skills in uh, writing papers, but uh, I just picked a couple of examples. So I, I, that doesn't really uh, mean too much. Um, where you publish is quite important. Of course, you know, there's always the worry of, citations are you getting the credit for this stuff because that's what counts really and we like to think that it doesn't matter but it does uh, and uh, that's always a constant worry um, 
you know, I try not to worry about it that much and try to forget about it and just say, if you write a good paper, it's going to be fine. And normally that works out, but you have to go out and sell this stuff uh, as well. Um, but yes, it varies a lot on what, you know, means a sensible number of papers. Um, but, you know, the order of two a year is, I think, a, a standard um, benchmark that people would uh, be happy with. Um, but people can publish, you know, way in excess of that. I'm sort of more of that level, um, rather than producing a paper every, you know, month or so, which some people in theory community really do manage to do. But it doesn't really matter so much. I think quantity is is something that people will notice, but um, it's not essential um, to have a career. There are different routes around uh, around the problem. All right. Um, Conferences, obviously, uh, we do get to do a lot of travelling. I don't think I do that much, so I just put, put this, this on as just a few things I've done in recent years that I could uh, remember. Spend a lot of time in Europe, obviously, uh, the little green dots there, um, but we do get the opportunity to travel a bit further afield. I was down in Chile um, last year and been over in China, Hong Kong, Vietnam, those kind of places uh, as well, which has all been kind of fun. Um, but... Uh, I think one of, the, one of the things, again, that I've learned about that is that there's more and more of these kind of workshops, extended programs, abilities to travel and talk to people working in uh, similar areas. You have to do that because the community is international, um, but you have to learn to work on the road because you're traveling all the time um, and you need to do your research at the same time. So that was definitely a skill I had to learn, you know, um, subsequent to, to the PhD time. <coughs> Um, so the other thing I mentioned, I think, which is actually quite a good one, um, as a way to sort of meet new people and get involved in uh, the uh, areas outside of your immediate research, because that's really the key, right? You've got some very specific jobs to do. You need to publish that. And you need to get this stuff out to make your, your name known and make sure that you can move on. Um, but you've got, you can't forget about the big picture, right? You've got to listen to other people as well. And getting involved in uh, conferences and workshops is the best way uh, to do that. So I was um, in Copenhagen uh, involved in setting up a few workshops and things like that, um, which I've got some pictures for. Um, so it was, uh, this, is, this room is actually the room where um, Niels Bohr had his famous conferences um, on, in quantum mechanics on, in the 30s. So often when we have conferences there, we take photos in a similar sort of vein. Um, to uh, memory, uh, give a sort of memory of that event. And uh, right at the front there, you can see that, uh, so that's uh, Gerardus Toft, who won the Nobel Prize um, for his work in, uh, in QCD. And, uh, and he's playing a little trumpet there because they used to have a little trumpet in the talks to, uh, to blow on if they thought the idea was a good one. And they also had a little <laughs> and they and they also had a little cannon um, in the room that they would fire if they wanted to shoot down your idea because it was no good. Um, but yeah, we got a, a nice number of people to that, so, so it was nice that uh, we had Nobel Prize winners coming along, but also Nima Kani Hamed was there, um, so he's the inventor of extra dimensions and things like that. So uh, got a good, good opportunity to meet these kind of people and uh, get involved with what they're doing. Okay, uh, other thing is teaching. Um, so I said also I was working a lot in research institutions, right? So I had the opportunity to get involved with uh, PhD students and that was really rewarding for me. Uh, it was definitely a challenge. You have to try and communicate your ideas to someone uh, uh, in, in a time frame that's also useful for them, right? Um, and coming up with a project which is manageable and helps, uh, helps teach the, uh, the material. So I've had the opportunity of working, um, teaching, you know, the kind of specific things I do at more advanced level in PhD schools around the world. Um, and uh, I picked these pictures because uh, I was lucky enough to teach in this school in uh, Trani in Italy. So Trani is, a, uh, I think, the smallest um, city, in, uh, city in, in Italy, right down on the Amalfi Coast. Um, and essentially there's um, Vittorio del Duca, so he's a professor in Rome, um, is from that area and negotiated with the local uh, people that uh, we could uh, get their primary school for a week. So we all cram into this little room with a tiny little blackboard with still the little pictures that the, the kids have done around the walls. Uh, and we do some theoretical physics for a week and it's actually, it's actually quite fun. But yeah, it's an amazing place to do uh, these things. I was quite pleased with that one. All right, um, a couple more things left. How am I doing for time? I haven't been paying attention. Good, good. Um, 
So, uh, yeah, as I said, getting involved with um, students has been a big part of developing what I do. Um, that's been rewarding for me, uh, as well as for them, I hope, a little bit. Um, so people doing their PhDs when I uh, went around the place started collaborating with them. Uh, when I went to Copenhagen, actually, I took a PhD student, which isn't really very conventional uh, for someone with a non-permanent uh, position, but um, it worked out, and he got his PhD in 2014 and is currently doing a postdoc uh, in Athens, and that's Yalte Frasvi, a Danish guy, and, yeah, some guys in Berlin that I worked with as well who are still doing postdocs. Valeri's actually left now. He was really helpful on the coding side for some of the projects that we were doing. Certainly knew a lot uh, more than I did about that. Um, and, but he's now moved back to Berlin where he did his PhD uh, to take a job as a software developer there. So he did a couple of postdocs before he moved. Um, and that was one of the things I was going to say. Again, just examples of people I could remember off the top of my head <laughs> who have moved through you know, theoretical physics. They've done some postdocs and it's enabled them to get uh, jobs uh, outside of academia. So I thought, so Tristan uh, was an extremely talented guy uh, I met working in Copenhagen, who's now moved on uh, to Google. Um, Darren Ford was a good, interesting case because he spent quite a long time, he even got a permanent position and then decided, nah, no, no, I'd really rather uh, not do that uh, and moved into finance in some mysterious thing. I don't actually know what part of finance. But uh, yeah, that was uh, an interesting case. So there's always room to change your mind in this stuff. And I think that, yes, if you know what you want to do, fair enough, it's often not the case. And there's uh, plenty of opportunity to move because the skills that you learn are, are very transferable. So again, Kevin and uh, Kamal there all moved on to, to other things. Having you know, had very successful postdoc careers, I think they could have carried on, but they just decided not to. Uh, so the last kind of couple of minutes, I wanted to talk about grants because I think this is one of the really important things these days um, for you know getting to that permanent position. A lot of lecturer positions now, this is one of the key skills that they're asking you to prove that you've done. That often it's written as a willingness to apply for funding. Fair enough, but if you have secured funding through your um, career, it's a really big feather in your cap. Uh, so there's a lot of different bodies that you can uh, talk to uh, about this. It varies from you know, the European wines things, ERC, uh, individual postdocs for um, Marie Curie action, so just two year fellowship just personally for yourself, or you know, five year grants that fund yourself and perhaps you know, a whole team of postdocs and PhD students. Um, and then you know, smaller national foundations also um, playing a role. Public and private as well. There's even private funding, things like the Leverhulme Foundation. There's a Willem Foundation in Denmark that offer lots of these things. And it, it's just good to keep an eye out for what there is. Make sure you ask people. Not everybody ha knows all the different possible funding sources that you can look for. Um, so it is um, good to try and keep on top of that as much as possible. So I got a, I say I got a grant in um, Denmark um, for two years while I was there. And then uh, managed to get the uh, SDFC Fellowship for five years just for myself and also some money to hire a postdoc and a student on that as well. So that's, that ma that's great because it also makes me very independent. Right? So I already get to choose what I do uh, and that's quite important for me uh, within what I, uh, what I like to do. Right? Um, okay. Just I, I had a few sort of words on um, you know, what, what kind of things you need. Obviously with your first postdoc you're not going to be looking to maybe achieve one of these grants but within the second postdoc or so on you are going to be looking uh, try and move on to that kind of thing. Um, it's very competitive, obviously. Uh, everything uh, in academia tends to be. But it's also very unpredictable. You know, you spend a lot of time constructing a, a, um, a good um, uh, application, but, um, you know, there's a certain degree of lottery to where these things go. But, you know, that's, that's a good thing as well. Um, you know, you should always have a go. There's nothing to, to think why uh, you wouldn't be good enough to, to achieve one of these things, even though it's very competitive. But you do have to have a clear idea of what you want to do. That's the, the point of the bigger picture. If I'm just focusing on the one little thing that I need to do for this paper, then you're going to have to look bigger than that, I think, to get one of these grants. Um, you have to show that you're going to have some sort of impact um, with the results that you can achieve uh, with what you're going to do. Um, and show that you've got the skills to carry it out and all sorts of other things. But um, as I said, really that, that sort of bigger picture 
uh, side of it really starts to play a role here. At least I think so, I don't know. Um, everything about it, of course, but uh, that's been my experience. All right, so I'm just going to finish off with those questions I showed you on the, on the, the, the first slide. I don't know if I answered really any of them. But uh, how did I get into this? Well, I just sort of, I liked what I was doing. I enjoyed the experience that I'd taken. Uh, and I was always keen to look on to the next thing. What's the next problem? Um, I didn't really mind that lots of the problems were, you know, had open-ended answers. And as many answers that I got, I just opened up new questions. But that made it interesting to me. Is there a career path? Well, I think there is, actually. I think um, it does have its drawbacks. I mean, if you're not willing to move around. I mean, I moved around a lot, and I know a lot of people that didn't move around quite so much. Um, but uh, there's definitely a, a, a path uh, through to a, a permanent position with you know, a way to judge whether or not it's worth carrying on to the next stage. What kept me from leaving academia? Well, OK, I still enjoy what I do, so I was never really going to do uh, anything else unless someone forced me to. Um, I'm very independent. I enjoy that. Um, certainly a challenge. I learn new things every time something comes up. I never really knew what my job role was supposed to be. So I turn up and I get asked to do things and then I figure, figure out how that, how that works. Um, I, I don't know if I had to do something differently. Um, I don't know whether it would have helped, but uh, okay, I've enjoyed uh, that time anyway. So anyway, thanks for listening and any questions. Finished over there, so time for just one quick question. I think. Okay. I've got a bit of a weird one. So you said what the best thing about your job is. What, in your opinion, is the worst thing? Uh, well, I mean, instability, a bit of worry about that, anxiety. You know, is this is this going to work out? And you don't know. So you have to take that and try and put it at the back of your mind as much as possible. I think I'm pretty good at that. I can forget about that and just. <laughs> Gonna get on with what needs to be done.